Hi, everybody. It's been a long while. So, Big Joel's latest video about how YouTube tends to prefer conversational style videos over video essays got me thinking. And I thought I would give this a try because, you see, most of my previous videos were video essays, which required an enormous amount of work. We're talking hours of audio editing, video editing, and when you're doing all that with only 500 subscribers, it kind of gets pointless. Now, I'm not the kind of guy who cares a great deal about money. In fact, you might say that that's the defining quality of my adult life. But if I'm going to put this much effort into videos, I would like to feel like I'm making some kind of positive contribution to the discourse, but that didn't seem to be happening. Making these videos is basically a full-time job. And it's fun in a way, but it takes time away from what I actually want to do with my life, which is writing my books. So, that being the case, since I wasn't really contributing to the discourse, or moving the Overton window to the left, or doing anything, accomplishing any of the goals that I had set out to accomplish with this channel, I kind of just stopped. However, uh, Big Joel got me thinking about how conversational videos might go over well, or at least better than my previous attempts at long-form essays, so I started to think, why not? Let's give it a try. Let's have a conversation. Why not? Hello, Chief. Let's talk. Why not? Come on, I wasn't going to totally give up on the special effects and craziness. Anyway, so what do I want to talk about? Well, the thing that I most want to talk about right now is liberal hypocrisy. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's take the case of Tara Reid. Content warning. This video deals with sexual assault. Now, for those of you who don't know, Tara accused Joe Biden of sexual assault. And there has been quite a backlash from liberals on this. And it's kind of annoying. Actually, it's kind of devastating. But, you know, why is this so infuriating? It's because liberals should know better, okay? So first, let's talk about Tara. And let's talk specifically about why I find her claim credible. So I listened to Tara tell her story in her own words. And it was, frankly, quite compelling. Like, she had me in tears. But beyond the emotion of it, there is... There were patterns that I recognized in her story, patterns that I have seen many times before from other victims of sexual assault who came forward. I'm neurodivergent. I'm autistic. I found that out about four months ago. But to be perfectly blunt with you, I've suspected, uh, I want to say since I was about 15-ish, something. Um... Or at least I suspected that there was something atypical about me, but moving on from that. I don't really have social instincts, so I compensate. And one thing that I learned to compensate for was finding ways to tell if someone was lying to me. 
A few years ago, I watched a TED Talk called, I think it was called How to Spot a Liar, and there is a scientific basis for what, for the common tropes, let's say, the common behaviors that people often display when they're lying. And Tara displayed none of them. So let me give you an example. There was, and I can't remember her name, and frankly, I'm not going to look it up just for this little conversation, but there was a woman in the 90s who drowned her kids. I guess she just didn't want to be a mother anymore. And um, she made up this story about a stranger who kidnapped her who kidnapped the kids and drowned them in the lake. And as she's telling this story on camera, her mannerisms are very similar to what my mannerisms are right now. She's sitting there kind of like this. Her tone is very even, very flat. And at one point, while she's reliving the experience, or I should say relating the experience, of a stranger drowning her children, she smiles. That's right. She smiles when she describes her children drowning in a lake. Now this is called duping delight. And I'm going to show you two videos. Two mothers one is lying, one is telling the truth. And these were surfaced by researcher David Matsumoto in California. And I think they're an excellent example of what the truth looks like. This mother, Diane Downs, shot her kids at close range, drove them to the hospital while they bled all over the car, claimed a scraggy-haired stranger did it. And you'll see when you see the video, she can't even pretend to be an agonizing mother. What you want to look for here is an incredible discrepancy between horrific events that she describes and her very, very cool demeanor. And if you look closely, you'll see duping delight throughout this video. But at night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That haunts me the most. Now I'm gonna show you a video of an actual grieving mother, Erin Runyon, confronting her daughter's murderer and torturer in court. Here you're going to see no false emotion, just the authentic expression of a mother's agony. I wrote this statement on the third anniversary of the night you took my baby, and you hurt her, and you crushed her, you terrified her, until her heart stopped. And she fought, and I know she fought you, but I know she looked at you with those amazing brown eyes, and you still wanted to kill her. And I don't understand it, and I never will. It's the excitement, the thrill that someone feels when they fool somebody else. Tara displayed none of that. Not a trace. In fact, Tara's testimony about what Joe Biden did to her is very similar to the testimony of a woman who actually lost her children in a tragic homicide. She was crying, her voice was shaking, you could see her trembling, her face was flushed, her voice broke several times. And then when he did that, um, I was obviously pulling away, and he pulled back and said, you know, come on, man, I heard you liked me. Um, something to that effect. And that's what kind of jolted me. Like, I was trying to think what I did wrong um, to bring that on me. And then he um, he looked angry and irritated with me. And I... That's when I knew it was really... I. I was in a very difficult position because he was my boss and he was like my dad's age at the time. And I trusted him 
and looked up to him and I it was it was it was not like I disliked him I liked him but I just didn't like him in that way and I it was just shocking it was shattering actually and he said to me when he pulled back he pointed his finger at me and he said you're nothing to me you're nothing and mm. mm. he straightened his clothes and he he went away and um that sort of thing is hard to fake. Not impossible, but hard to fake. Now, in addition to all of that, Tara has a great deal of corroboration. Her brother, her neighbor, her mother's call to Larry King. Facts kind of start adding up. And yet, despite all of this, and more importantly, despite their philosophy of believing victims and believing women, liberals are really dragging Tara through the gutter. They're really going after her quite mercilessly, and it's disgusting. And the person that I am most disappointed with is Christy Winters. That's right. Now, for those of you who don't know, Christy is someone that I know and that I've admired for many years now, for about five years now, ever since she did that debate with uh, Sargon of Akkad. And, you know, we don't always agree on things like economics or populism, but we do agree on feminism. And that should be a very important contributing factor to her analysis of this particular case. Now, Christy has a video about why she doesn't believe Tara. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it because I am not willing to expose myself to something that's going to make my blood pressure go through the roof. I have enough rage looking at the general world around me. I accept that in Christie's mind, this is a case of... Tara lying for political benefit of some kind. But what I would ask Christy to consider is why she feels that way about somebody like Tara, but not about somebody like Christine Blasey Ford. And I think we have to acknowledge a certain amount of partisan bias here, because Christie very much views it through the lens of Bernie supporters are using Tara's claim to undermine Joe Biden's presidential bid. Which is ridiculous. Okay? I mean, are there some Bernie supporters who will take any weapon they can use against Joe Biden? Yeah. I'm not going to lie about that. That's There's probably a few out there who would do that. But there is a legitimacy to the things that Tara is saying. So I haven't watched Christie's video because I've heard all of the anti-Tara arguments so many times, and I just don't want to hear them again. So rather than address her specifically... I'm going to deal with sort of the more generic arguments that I've heard a bajillion times on this subject. And if I missed one, I mean, I guess Christy will probably come and, I don't know, yell at me or something, or she probably won't even see this. Whatever. Um, here we go. Okay. Number one. Tara said something nice about Russia that one time. 
or 10 times. I don't know, because it really doesn't matter, okay? I know that Russia is the liberal boogeyman. I don't want to get into Russiagate right now. I mean, I've already done a video on that, and yeah, I don't believe it, okay? I used to believe it, I don't believe it anymore. If you want a comprehensive analysis on it, I suggest looking up Aaron Mate. He'll take you through it and all of its dubiousness. Anyway, moving on from that. I realize that the liberal position is that Russia is deliberately trying to undermine American democracy, and so having a favorable opinion of Russia means that Tara Reid is probably trying to undermine American democracy as well. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem with that. It's irrelevant. A person's political beliefs, a person's political outlook, has no bearing on whether or not they were assaulted. I don't care if Tara believed the most asinine things ever. I don't care if her politics say that the world is run by lizards who control the human population through telepathic messages. It's irrelevant. It has no bearing on whether or not she was assaulted. And there is an enormous amount of corroboration of her story. We should evaluate her claim on its own merits and not on this sort of superfluous information. And I know somebody's going to show up in the comments and be like, but you have to understand something, something, Russia, something, something, threat to democracy. And you know what? That's what the block button is for. Okay. Number two. <clears throat> but Tara Reed bounced a check that one time, or failed to pay her rent that one time, or whatever the hell they're coming up with. Now, this one is particularly egregious because I've heard feminists talk about exactly this line of rhetoric for years. The fact is that there is no such thing as the perfect victim. You can look through any victim's history, and you'll find something they did wrong because they're human, and humans do things that are wrong. More importantly, this sets up a very dangerous precedent because it opens the door to dismiss victims based on any imperfection in their past behavior. And since you can always find one, you can use this line of reasoning to dismiss any victim. Number three. Tara is too ugly to have been raped. I mean, really? You know, I remember in 2016 when I wrote an article for Telesur criticizing Sargon of Akkad after he used this exact line of attack on Jess Phillips. He said that Jess Phillips was too ugly to be raped. And I pointed out that it was misogynistic bullshit. And I distinctly remember a lot of liberal feminists praising me quite thoroughly for that one. So if it was true then, it's true now. And this kind of thing is so gross because it portrays being attractive enough to be raped as some kind of badge of honor. And I, I trust that I don't have to explain to you why that's bullshit, right? Number four. Tara's story has changed too many times. Now, again, this is the kind of rhetoric that is deployed against pretty much every victim of sexual assault. 
and it's wrong every time. Now, why? Well, let's review what we've learned a hundred times over now. Victims often tell their stories in chunks. A little bit at first, then they expand on it, and then they provide more details later. And the reason for this, quite frankly, is that the act of coming forward is a very difficult process in which they're going to be subjected to some rather brutal scrutiny. And that naturally has an intimidating effect. So the result is that they're really not going to feel comfortable in most cases revealing every aspect of the story all at once. Now, I've never been a victim, not of sexual assault anyway. Uh, I've never been a victim of sexual assault, so I can't really tell you what they're thinking, but I would imagine if I were in their place, based on other forms of abuse that I've reported, that I often used to tailor the story to focus specifically on the details that I thought the other person would believe, even if it wasn't necessarily the most egregious part of the story. So, you know, even if it wasn't the worst thing that happened to me, I would tell what I thought would be the most believable part of the story. And then maybe I would share the other details later when I thought there was a better chance that I would be listened to. And I'm willing to bet that it's much the same for Tara. Okay? So let's not shame her for the fact that her story evolved, because that is a natural part of the process. And that's about all I have to say right now. So, okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.